It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcasting and interviewing Dr. Chris Allington, DMD, AEGD, which is an advanced education general dentistry, which he got from UConn. He started working with his father's dental office in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada, at the age of 14. After finishing his Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science at the Queen's University, he did a one-year internship at Hoffman La Roche in Basile, Switzerland. In 2001, he entered McGill Dental School in Montreal, Quebec, graduating in 2000. Following a one-year AEGD residency, he returned to Montreal working in a variety of practices in Ontario, Quebec, and Vermont and teaching part-time at McGill. His goal was to get as much experience as possible prior to moving to his ultimate destination, Bermuda, in 2008. He worked as an associate from 2008 until 2018 when he purchased a practice where he works full-time. He has served as the president of the Bermuda Dental Association and is the current chair of the Bermuda Dental Board. Dr. Allington is a fellow of the Academy of General Dentistry, fellow of the ICOI, International Congress of Plantology, and has, an invis- and has been an Invisalign Plus Goal uh, provider. Recently, he began organizing dental continued education, bringing speakers to Bermuda to help educate his office and the rest of the dental community. When not working, he enjoys traveling, spending time with his wife and two daughters, and keeping in shape while playing ball hockey with a bunch of Canadians stuck on the rock. So my, my gosh, uh... How, um, thanks so much for coming on the show. Well, th- thank you for having me, Howard. It's a great, great honor. So what's the population of Bermuda and how many dentists are there? Well, we are about 60,000 people. It's always in a little bit of flux. Uh, and there are between 25 and 30 dentists, depending on what you define as a dentist, specialist, part-time guy working part-time. So, so it's, it's how many people? 60,000 and between 25 and 30 dentists. Wow. So the, the, the first thing I want to um, talk about is when, when you go to these islands, um, they're like small towns, but they're really defined margins. So what is the um, what is the culture like of the 2530 dentists? I mean, because you're with the Bermuda Dental Association and you're the yeah. chair of the Bermuda Dental Board. Yeah. So you yeah. you you know all of those 25 dentists. So yeah, it's it's a good thing and a bad thing that you got a, you got access to all the dentists, but you also they all have access to you, which is great. But um, uh, if there's ever a problem, you know everybody. So um, there's it's very diff- it's very difficult to be impartial. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. We if you look on the island, there's basically three places people have trained: Canada, the U.S., or the U.K. Um, we have one or two that trained in the Caribbean. What, what, what are, are the three places? Canada, the U.S., and the United Kingdom. Um, so, uh, and it's pretty close to a third. I've never done that. I've never counted, but it's pretty close to a third, a third, a third. Uh, a third trained in Canada, a third trained in the U.S., and a third trained in the U.K. So it leads to a, an interesting interesting culture. And, you know, it's it, it, being so small here, you'd think that it would be more, you know, streamlined. People might do things more the same. But I would dare to reckon that we have the same diversity of care and treatment as you would get in the United States. Um, the only thing we, we lack is uh, is some of the specialists. Um, but we've got we've got everything here. We've got uh, one of the guys here is, has been an educator at Spears. Um, we've got some exceptionally good dentists, and then we've just got you know st- stuff that you'd find in any small town, any any town in uh, in the U.S. or even in a big city. So. Uh, it's interesting when you get to a small community, you realize it's kind of the same as a big community with a few different exceptions. So that's a, that's a dentist, a population ratio of uh, one to 21, about 2000. So that, that's yeah. a, that's the same ratio as the United States. It's quite similar. Yeah. Um, and it's always a debate here. You know, do we need more dentists? Do we not need more dentists? When I first came to Bermuda, uh, in 2008, there were a couple of older guys just retiring and slowing down. A couple of guys that did retire and they did, literally had no one to give their practices to. Um, and when you look at the dynamics, uh, the one major difference between Canada or between North America and Bermuda is that we don't really advertise here. Um, so when I came down, I'm like, Hey, maybe we should do a little bit of advertising, try to get some people in uh, coming from Montreal, which was hyper competitive. And, uh, boss is like, yeah, probably not needed. We're I'm sort of overflowing. Um, when I first came in, the practice was booking out for restorative appointments nine months ahead of time. So I really had to pick up some of the stuff that was just lagging. So I, I was busy right away. Um, that's changed today substantially. We've got a lot more dentists here, a lot more 
uh, a lot more people looking um, uh, looking for work, and the dentist schedules are starting to get a little bit patchier. Um, but uh, uh, th- when I th- when I mentioned advertising to patients, a few of them said, "If I ever saw you advertising, there's no way I'd show up at your office because it means you're a bad dentist. You got to advertise." So it's all word of mouth here. Um, small communities, uh, word gets around fast, um, and uh, it's it's worked well. And and there's some advantages and disadvantages to that. And I was speaking to a guy like you, who's who's always been on the cutting edge of advertising. Might seem might seem like it's a little foreign, but um, you know we we try to we try to do marketing, but we don't try, we don't do a lot of advertising. Yeah. So the um so it's 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 a British. Um, I mean, it's British. an independent country, but it's um, a British. We're a British, de- we are a British dependent territory. So, um, so is that um? So, do you trade the British pound or the U.S. dollar or the Canadian or all three? We're pegged to the U.S. dollar, so uh, the currency is the same. We have our own dollar, we have our own currency, but it is pegged one to one to the U.S. dollar, uh, and it's been able to maintain and do that because of all the international business here, which started with tourism back in the. 50s, 60s, and 70s, and now is mostly international insurance and reinsurance businesses. So there's a good chance that your that your insurance provider in the United States, um, your malpractice provider, is reinsured in Bermuda because there's really only there's three big centers in the world where that happens, and and we're one of them. Yeah, that's kind of a uh, that that's a whole. Yeah, we we could do a podcast just just on on uh, on the need for all these uh, people to go to these islands. So, so let, let's back up all the way. How did you growing up in Canada decide you wanted to go live the rest of your life on an island in Bermuda, which, which how, how far away is that from the, uh, I'm looking at it on the map. That's how, how far is that from the mainland? If you, if you so, flew straight to North America from. So the, the closest point of land is 600 miles off of North Carolina. Um, the quickest flight here is usually up to New York, which is a, about an hour and 15 minutes fly time. Uh, and why I came down here, uh, I found a, I met a woman. Yeah. I, I, I married a Bermudian. Uh, my, uh, my father grew up, I, I grew up, uh, I worked in my dad's office sweeping his floors when I was in high school. Um, and, uh, eventually found my way into dental school. And it was never a certainty that I was going back to Peterborough to work, but it was always in the back of my mind. But uh, I I uh, I moved back from from Europe to start McGill, uh, and I had uh, decided oh I didn't want to be in a relationship or date anyone. I just uh, I I just uh, finished a long term relationship, and the first day I was there, I met my wife, um, and that was that. So uh, within about three months, it became pretty apparent that. Uh, if we were together, I was coming to Bermuda. So I started looking at it and it looked to be a pretty good place to go. So, um, just from then on, that was sort of the, the goal. It's a pretty rare behavior. Only three, according to the UN, only 3% of the world's seven and a half billion people live currently in a country they weren't born in. And it's always, um, because of, um, work or love. I mean, that, yeah. that's, that's the whole, the whole deal. So you went there and then met your wife. No, she, uh, I met her at McGill actually. She's a, she's a physician. Oh, okay. Um, and McGill was one of the, one of the first schools, I think Harvard might've been the first one, but basically McGill ran out of money and, uh, they needed to amalgamate some, some of the courses for medicine and dentistry. So I think most schools will have some overlap. Uh, but what McGill did was they actually enrolled the dental students in the first two year curriculum of medicine. So we didn't do much on teeth at all for the first year and a uh, year and a half, uh, two years at McGill, uh, bef- uh, because we were studying with the, the medical faculty, um, which my wife was in. So that's how we met. Uh, they didn't distinguish between doc- dentists and, and physicians. Uh, uh, so that yeah, just went from there. Well, it, it, it's the better system. And when, when people always talk about, um, how great their country is, it's like, well, come on, dude, there's 200 countries. Um, can you tell, tell me what's better or worse in all the other countries? And the, the, the Soviet union did it the best. I mean, the, um, dentistry was a branch of medicine and it was called stomatologist. And what I, and it was so great because, um, the undergrad's the same. The first two years is the same. Uh, when I was in dental school, all of our teachers for the first two years taught at, um, the med school. Uh, but what I like about it is when you're an older dentist and something happens and you can't do surgery all day, 
you can just go back and do a residency in dermatology and then now you're a dermatologist or go back to the yeah. hospital. So um, it yeah. just, I mean, it, it makes no sense that every part of the body is integrated with an MD except yeah. the DDS and the podiatrist, um, yeah. you know, and, um, and, and I like the, um, the reason why the U S Congress covered, uh, the chiropractors and their Medicare and Medicaid, mm -hmm. um, because they said, you know, if you have a lower back problem, you go to an MD, they're going to spend $50,000 and do some surgery fusion spine thing. And then five yeah. years later, you still have a problem and you go to the yeah. chiropractor, he's going to do it for 1500 and five years later, you're still going to have the problem. So neither yeah. of you fix the problem. So we'd rather not fix it for 1500 than 50 grand, but it all needs to go back to integration and I'm sure it will sometime. So when you're on an Island like that, um, uh, does the internet become more important because your substitutes in the marketplace are all going to be digital as opposed to driving? Yeah. So, uh, it, it, yes and no. I mean, Bermuda, uh, the internet is important here. Uh, we were a little bit behind the times in terms of uh, getting up to speed and the cost is a lot more than in the Canada States. But, um, you know, in terms of communication with, with our, uh, with our labs and our colleagues, um, certainly the internet is important. Uh, if you look at continue education, we've always provided some on the Island, but never enough to, to get all the credits you'd want, uh, and never all the advanced, uh, advancements. So, um, with, uh, with all the CE online now, um, it's, it's a super great facilitator. Um, and we've had dentists all the way from one year out of school to, uh, this year, I actually, um, I signed a guy up in his eighties for, um, dental town and, uh, CE on demand, um, uh, Viva learning because he hadn't got a CE credit in years. And we just instituted a, a mandatory, um, CE requirement. So he hadn't taken CE in the ages. He called me and said, Oh, can I, uh, can you just pass me without the CE? And I said, well, not really It's for a whole bunch of reasons, but um, he just didn't want to fly over. In his mind, he was getting on a plane and flying over to the States. He didn't realize all these things were available online. So I literally signed him up, sent him an email uh, with, his, with his log on to Dentaltown and to, um, and to Viva Learning, and he banged off his credits in a couple of months. So, And that's so yeah. neat because in a community like that, you have a human relationship. Whereas yeah. in like a big city with a million people, you know, you wouldn't even have known who you were talking to and, uh, you know, it would yeah. have been, uh, you know, she probably would have just said, if you don't, I'll take your license away. You know, it's just, uh, it's, yeah. uh, I, I love that. Um, so what, what, what did you end up going with, uh, your Bermuda, uh, requirements? Uh, you said the Bermuda dental board just, uh, instituted a uh, continued education requirements. Uh, what were they? So, uh, at first we've got them fairly loose, um, uh, first, uh, first year we did it, it was just 40 hours over two years. Um, then we changed it to 40 hours of which 24 had to be clinical. Um, cause a lot of, you know, a lot of hours are on, um, are in practice management, management, which is great, but we do want to have some basic clinical on there. There's the mandatory, uh, CPR requirement. Um, you know, moving forward, it would be nice, uh, to, you know, to look at the core things that we figure everyone should have every year, um, oral medicine, um, uh, pathology, radiology, uh, infection control, that sort of thing. Um, and with the way the internet is now, it'd be pretty easy to do. Uh, we could assign courses on dental town, assign courses on Viva or, or, um, uh, there's, there's tons of, I'm sure you're aware of all the online, uh, courses that are available for free. Um, uh, so, well, so what, what is the main ones for free for you now? Well, the ones that I use are, you know, uh, with you guys, you've got the, uh, a platform where internationally that you don't charge people. So well, as long or if as you're I'm a dental student or if you're a dental student. So, yeah. so if I'm, if I'm on a, if I'm on a VPN in the U S I got to pay for it. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, but it's because I'm in Bermuda. Um, dental town has, uh, has put them on online for us for, for, for free. Um, Viva learning is another good resource. Um, I subscribe to Frank Spears, which is a monthly fee, but you've got access to all sorts of stuff there. Um, you know, now, what now, I realized, do you guys share that on the island? No, there's a few offices that have it. Um, uh, I do, and uh, and uh, uh, I, if I was to use that as a public forum, I'd have to call them and find out 
uh, or dinner under the table, but um, uh, uh, not how you want to organize something. Um, but no, we've, we've got our own, uh, our own office subscription. Um, dentinal tubules was a good one. I realized I was getting all my education from North America and realized they do things a little bit differently in Europe. And, you know, I think we do have this bias of the way we do things is the best way to do things. Um, and I think that may be in part because in North America, so much of our, of our CE is funded by the, the, um, the dental supply companies, um, which is great. I mean, it's so much for, that, that they're providing us, but sometimes we may or may not follow the science as well as different places in the world. And if you look at things picking up, like, uh, using, use a glass ionomer, I just heard one of your talks this week, uh, uh, with silver diamine and fluoride, you know, we've always, you know, we're behind the ball a little bit with that. Um, uh, and when I say we, I'm talking about North America. Um, whereas in Europe, you know, they think differently. They do things differently. Um, uh, do you need to replace that first or second molar with an implant? They have a different opinion than we do, or at least I've heard that over there. So, uh, it's interesting to, to, to hear what they say and look at the research done in both places. So, uh, the, uh, you know, Kerr's got a free, uh, learning site, uh, Glidewell's got a huge free, uh, learning site, uh, um, uh, dental XP, uh, is a small monthly fee. They've got some very good, really good courses on them. And I would think that most of the big suppliers do have uh, continuing education. So you can find it everywhere, whether it's credited or not. Colgate's got a massive, got a huge one. Um, yeah, all those places. When, when we sent out our list to our dentist, there was at least eight places on there. We, they could get, uh, CE for free online. That is awesome. Um, yeah, Colgate was in the news today. What, what did they do? Um, um, yeah, they, uh, oh, they just released their um, Colgate Plaqueless Pro. Tells you how to clean your teeth in real time. They just launched their um, artificial intelligence high-end uh, Plaqueless Pro smart electric toothbrush uh, that connects to your phone on Bluetooth. Do you really think that's going to be a thing? I mean, I mean, you can hardly get anybody to brush and floss now uh, other than wanting to be sexier and, and all that, not for decay. But do you really think they're going to wake up and take an electric toothbrush and turn on their Bluetooth and fire it up? Well, I know Sonicare's had that available for a while. And, you know, we've gone through different f stages of uh, providing – uh, retail items at our office, um, which is a challenge in Bermuda just because getting things in can be difficult. So we've got several patients on Sonicare that, um, that have used it and they all say the app's a pain in the ass. Um, maybe it's cause we're here, but most people don't use it. I think the best thing, the best thing is a timer. Um, and unless your parents, unless you're a parent watching your kids on, on the app, I, I don't know, uh, how often uh, people are going to be logging in to, to check if they're uh, brushing for two minutes. Yeah, I, I just teach all my patients, I say, look, look, you know, you, I, I, I don't think they're going to use an app. I don't think uh, that they're going to do it for three minutes. So what I just tell them to do, is, it's all in your mind. Um, when, when they do research, when you take a shower, if they film you take a shower a hundred times, you wash everything in the same order. Um, when you put your shoes on a a hundred times, you always put the same shoe on first. So I said, all you have to do is get a habit that when you start brushing your teeth, you do a, a chore or two that takes two or three minutes. So, you know, yeah. maybe you go pull out your socks and underwear and lay out, lay, get out your clothes or something. So yeah. I always, um, I always start brushing. And then as I'm brushing, I go to my next task, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, so, so that's, so yeah, the, the, um, uh, dental tubules, I, I really like um, that guy. Yeah. Have you been on there? Oh yeah, I, he, he was. Uh, um, I, I podcast interview him. Uh, yeah, that's how, that's how I found out about it. I heard about it with uh, on your podcast. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, and I love him and his wife is a class act. She's uh, uh, she's so neat. He, he's a periodontist. I forgot what. Um, I I think him and his wife are both periodontists, right? Are they? Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. But but England England is a different country. Um, and and I I like I've learned so m I've learned more from visiting and speaking in 50 different dental tribes around the world than I ever did from sure. us. I mean, last week, um, before Christmas, I was a week in Israel. And I mean, just yeah. the, the little nuances in dentistry and and patient care and technology, it, it's just so amazing. Yeah. So so what's the DMFT like of Bermuda? I mean, um, is it water fluoridation? Is it rampant decay? Is it, um, what, what does it remind you of? Uh, so we don't have great stats about it. Um, but uh, it's, uh, if I had to guess, I'd say it's pretty high. Uh, 
our water, uh, we're actually cistern based. So basically we catch our water on our roofs. It goes beneath our houses. So we don't have uh, we don't have fluoridated water, but we don't have a central system to put it into. Um, there's a water fluoridation program in the school, which you need to opt out of. So uh, we do see, I perceive we see a bit of fluorosis and I don't know if that's from the school or from, from other sources. Uh, uh, but uh, fluoride is available here, and, and the the government clinics have done a good job of providing it to kids. Um, we've debated going to ionized uh, into salt fluoridation, but that that hasn't happened, and there's logistical problems with that. Um, but I would say the DMFT is is on the higher side of North America. I've seen the last study that came from here said we were we were lower, meaning we had less decay. Um, but uh, it um, it's also how they're doing it is they're going into schools um, and just looking with um, uh, with flashlight. They were looking with flashlights, I think, at the last time. So they weren't they weren't geared up to do it as well as one could in a dental office. So when you look at DFMT, you also got to look at how they got gain got the research. Um, was it public health people going out with a flashlight, or were they coming into your office with a big overhead light, intraoral uh, loops, and and uh, and looking? So um, yeah, it. Uh, I would say our carries rate's pretty high. And you're, um, you, Dr. David S. Samuels. Yeah. Um, he, he, did he retire on the island? Yeah. Um, no, he, uh, David Samuels, uh, is, uh, he, he was, uh, had significant involvement with the Mass Dental Society. He ran Yankee for a couple of years. Uh, Perry Donis, who, uh, in his oh, late 40s, early 50s, just sort of wound his practice down. His kids had grown up. And he wanted to uh, he wanted to work as a, as an associate, so he was familiar with the island. He came down, met a few of us, and ended up um, coming down here. And he comes down two weeks a month and works. Uh, he works with a group called Smiles Inc. Uh, with um, Dr. Stephen Cardwell and, and our and our only oral surgeon on the island, Dr. Akbar Lightborn. Um, and he provides uh, periodontal services here that weren't. Um, that weren't really available before. Um, so he's been a great asset to the community. He's such a good guy um, in terms of what he's done for dentistry and really involved and and uh, and thrilled about uh, about everything. I'm glad well, you brought him up. Well, um, I brought him up because he wrote um, an article um, said gum disease. Um, bo- um, Island's hidden epidemic. And he says, while most Bermudans are aware of the disproportionate high prevalence of diabetes throughout the population, very few understand there's an equally ominous infection disease, uh, more people periodontists. Um, so um, why is, do you think, well, first of all, do you agree that there's a disproportionately high prevalence of diabetes throughout the population? Yeah, so, I mean, it's interesting. Right now we're actually going through um, healthcare reform here. And one of the, the things is, is we're looking at trying to decrease the cost of healthcare. And dentistry is getting involved with this because, the, you know, the model that they're trying to use um, may or may not involve dental care to either a very basic level or up to a complete comprehensive level. Um, so uh, our, when you look at the numbers of our, of our annual spending for healthcare, we're, we're similar to the U.S. I think the U.S. is 17 percent. We're closer to 14 or 15 um, and they like to say we have the highest health care in the world, but they put a little asterisk beside it after the United States. So the United States has the highest cost of health care in the world, and Bermuda's number two. Um, but, I, you know, when you look at that, you got to figure out why it's happening. And is it the cost of care here? Is it uh, overprescription of services? Uh, is it that the population's unhealthy? And... Uh, it has been stated, and I'm not positive the, the truth in this, but that we have that we have the highest diabetes and uh, heart disease rate in the world. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me, uh, but I don't know it to be factual. But so it is very high. So, so why why do you think if, if it is high? Um, do you, what what would you say that you think it's from? Well, I mean, there's uh, there's three sources basically. I think there's uh, genetics. There is uh, activity and then there's the care that you receive and if i had to guess it would probably be a combination of, of everything for me it's a temperate climate but it's not the easiest place to exercise um our roads are really small our speed limit's only uh 20 miles an hour um but people go a lot faster and when you've got these windy roads like you might see in um in rural england uh it's hard to get out and just go for a walk uh so there's there's that um 
you know, just looking at U.S. statistics, it's well documented that the African-American population has a higher rate of diabetes uh, and obesity than uh, the Caucasian population. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that may or may not happen. But the same thing happens here. I think it's inarguable that there's a genetic component involved in it. Um, and then the care that you receive, um, you know, both the care that you're actually getting and the care that you're actually seeking. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a possibility that people just aren't seeking care when things are in the early stages. There, And um, people don't tend to go to the doctor if they, if they need to. And, and that could be financial or that could just be, um, they don't, they don't feel it's important or, or, uh, they're, they're scared of going to the, to the physician and or dentist. But, but it is neat that you're thinking about, um, um, tying the more dental, um, part into the, uh, the medical part with the diabetes, um, mm -hmm. and, and talking about the, the game. Yeah, no, it's, there's definitely a connection. And I mean, the oral systemic link, I think is something that, uh, is I don't want to say it's a hot topic in dentistry because now it's pretty obvious that it um, that that it exists. The question is is what do we do about it? Uh, how do we inform patients that it's scaring them too much? Um, how do we uh, set up programs to to look at it? How do we join with our colleagues and um, and uh, in in medicine and, and try to uh, and try to tackle it? Um, you know, you've got these great groups like Bale Dunin that's that's included dentistry now, um, but you know that's still the minority. Um, I think you've you've talked to, to Bradley Bale and um, oh, what's the uh, the Donine, uh, uh, the, the nutritionist. Are you familiar with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the so, Bale Bale uh, Donnell, the Bale Dolane, uh, Bale Donine. I think is the is the so basically that yeah what we've they, had him on the show. Yeah, so you know that what they talk about is instead of heart disease, um, you know, being a, an issue of. Uh, of, um, of, of, uh, as it's traditionally thought, really, you've got to think of more of a, the, uh, they think of it as more of a, a vascularologist, I believe is what he calls it. Um, so you're looking at the vessels and the physiology of how, um, of how plaques develops and more importantly, how plaques become unstable. Um, but they certainly recognize that, uh, dentistry is a, a major part of it. And there's been a lot of cases where they've had, where patients have been doing everything to, to get back healthy and they've eaten well and they've followed all the steps. But, um, the one thing they missed was the dentist. And then when they go get period treatment, which could be anything from scaling and root planning to extractions and, and implants, they get better. So, um, definitely a connection there. So you've, um, you've worked in so many different practice environments, countries, Canada, the U S Bermuda. Um, you work for DSO as an associate being the owner um, my gosh, um, so many of these kids, a fourth of everyone listening to you right now is in dental school. The rest yeah. are all under 30. Uh, email me, Howard at dentaltown.com and tell me who you are and, 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 um, where you're at in life. But, um, do you think looking at the, uh, the UK, the Canadian, the Bermuda, what would you tell a young kid who's in dental school right now? Um, what they should be thinking of, of head and, and what, what, what do you think that young kid listening to you today um, what, what do you think is a part of their constitution that would make them do better in each different environment and how, how they should think about rolling out their journey? Well, I mean, I think you really got to at least have some concept of beginning with the end in mind. You got to figure out where you want to be, what you want to do, and what kind of um, practice you want to have. Um, and then you've got to, you know, tailor yourself towards uh, – towards that. And, you know, that's probably going to change from when you start to when you, to when you, uh, actually, uh, reach the, the end of your career. Um, but, uh, it's always good to think about the, the future and not, not about exactly what's best in front of you, right. Um, right. When you graduate, you know, uh, I don't think it's wise to graduate from dental school and go get the job that pays the most or that, uh, you know, percentage wise, when you look at it being an associate, um, or you might be able to take on a practice and generate a lot of revenue, but not have any mentor there. So I would encourage the students to, to think about, you know, where they want to be in 10 years out from practice or five years out from practice, and then work towards, uh, work towards that goal. Um, you know, I think it's important. And I think most, most students even recognize that when you finish dental school, you don't really know a lot. Um, most dental students, you know, they finish with maybe 
10 crown preparations if they're lucky. They're lucky to do a molar endo. So you got to do something to get yourself educated, um, whether that's a GPR, an AGD, like a general, a general residency, um, working with um, – uh, working with a DSO or going to associate with someone who's, you know, not churning out a factory, not, um, um, not, uh, um, uh, just wanting you to, to do the, the crap left over, um, or have you sit in the back and just see emergencies. Um, but you know, all those things, what they have in common is, is you need to find a mentor. You need to find somebody who can help you, uh, grow and help you, you know, talk about your frustrations um, uh, and help bail you out when you've got a problem. And more importantly, help you learn when you bail yourself out. So, um, you have one oral surgeon on the, um, on the Island. Um, yep. is that, um, he has to bail out everyone. Uh, well, there's a few of us that will, that, that, uh, that get called when there's problems. Um, there's a few dentists on the Island that, uh, are pretty good in surgery. Um, and, uh, I've gone to a couple offices to finish some extractions or had the patient sent over the oral surgeons done it with, uh, he does it. He does it a lot more than I do. Um, we're here, a few we're he'll actually drive to the office. Uh, I don't know if he'll drive to an office, but I know he'll see patients in his office halfway through a procedure. Yeah. Um, uh, I've, I've driven to a couple a couple dentist office that refer to me when they've had problems, uh, doing something and finished uh, what they started. Um, just easier that way. Uh, yeah, I was so lucky. Um, I, I had to drive at least half a dozen people to, uh, Dr. Don gas oral surgeon in Chandler. And he was always a, just a sweetheart about it. And then I had another one, Bob Sunberg, a dentist, a general dentist, um, up, uh, down the street, two miles. And, uh, same thing with him. It was just, uh, it was so cool. So you could try all these things and not have to worry about if you got stuck. Yeah. Well, and I had the same thing in my office. I mean, the guy I worked for and now he works for me um, is uh, Dr. Ian Campbell, who uh, may be the world's greatest single tooth dentist. This guy's work is just immaculate and exceptional. Um, and he really thinks about everything uh, in terms of how he's, uh, um, how he's working. Uh, and it was really good when I, whenever I get stuck and it could be, it could be anything, not being able to get an impression or uh, difficult extraction. He'd come in, help me out and, and, uh, uh, and, and bail me, uh, bail me out. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you also get, you also learn uh, real quick how to do all that stuff yourself. Right. Um, one of the, one of the advantages of being on an island, you, you often don't have anybody to call. So, um, and you don't have anybody to refer your tough cases to So you just end up doing them all. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's good about what, what, what other challenges, um, do you think that, um, you have living on an island. How, how many miles by how many miles? I know, I know. Uh, I should be asking that in kilometers, but I am a no, no. American. It's miles. No, we it's miles by miles. Use, we only use metric when we're buying our nine millimeter shells on our way to go buy drugs. Uh, that's the only time we do metric. Um, so, how many miles is it? We are twenty one miles long and one mile wide. Oh my gosh, that's crazy! Oh. So, so is yeah. that a um, is that a psychological issue? That what do they call it? Island fever? Island fever? Yeah, it it, it, it can be. I mean, it's pretty diverse here in terms of uh, the topography and for a town this size, there's a lot of things to do. But yes, people definitely suffer from island fever. Yeah, um, and then you're then you're always running into your patients. I mean, you can't be Always. at the beach drinking beer, or fish, and tuna in your nope. underwear, and then have nope. your implant patient walk by. Yeah, it it, it happens all the time. Uh, happens to do doctors, happens to dentists. Um, yeah, you can't get away from them. So yeah, I, lo I look bad. at the number of cavities in Phoenix, and I look at the uh, the percentage where they say, you know, half the people said they saw a dentist last year. I'm like, yeah, but they saw him at Safeway. They didn't see yeah. him at a dental office. You know, they saw yeah. him uh, buying beer at midnight. They didn't see him uh, um, for a, a cleaning. Uh, yeah. But is that um is that harder for um introvert dentists. I mean, I, I, when I think of a dentist, they're always a mathematician introvert and introverts are drained by people. Whereas extroverts are fueled by them. Is, is that draining for the introvert dentist on the Island? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, I know a lot of people are get quite stressed when they, you know, going out in public and, uh, talking to people who may or may not want to do things. They're like, ah, I'll see my patient there. Um, and they, and, and uh, it's just not a, it's not a comfortable setting for them. So it, it definitely does. It does. It does play a role here. Um, me, I'm fine with it. 
uh, but uh, a lot of people aren't. So, well, it's kind of interesting because if you look through the animal kingdom, I mean, most, I mean, a bird wants to be alone in its nest. I mean, the animals in their caves. I mean, most all animals they they want to be with the tribe, but they also um, want to be um, alone. So that that's a tough deal. So, um. How do you like the state you're at now of owning your own office? Because you were an associate with that guy for, what, a decade? Yeah, uh, yeah, I spent a full decade as an associate. Um, you know, if, if you had asked me when I came how long I'd have been an associate, it wouldn't have been that long. Um, I thought I was ready to go after about uh, as soon as I got here. Um, but it just worked out well, actually. Um, uh, I was treated well, um, and uh, finances weren't an issue. So um, it worked well for me. Um, the stage I'm at now... Uh, you know, I'm still learning. Um, uh, you know, part of what I've just had to do, uh, this is the first full year I've owned it. I've owned the office for, for since I guess June of, uh, 18. Um, and, uh, this is the first full year. And what I've done is I've, I've tried to make a lot of changes and some of them have gone well and some of them haven't. And I'm, and I'm going back and saying, okay, now what worked and what didn't. Um, so, uh, I'm, uh, I'm still a work in progress. So, um, so what, um, what, after, after your first year, um, what, what did you try that, um, backfired and what did you try that worked well? Did you use a dental consultant or, uh, yeah, yeah. So I've done, done a couple of things and this started while I was an associate as well. Um, you know, I went to, uh, initial, the, initial, the first con- consultant we had in was a uh, transitions group out of Canada. Um, Lisa Phelps is, uh, is, uh, is running that and, I uh, found out of her, found out of, of her because of her, um, her, she came down here to, to, to talk a couple of times. Uh, she's an exceptional speaker. Uh, I'd encourage anyone who could, could what, go what's here her name? To, Lisa to Phelps, Lisa Phelps. Yeah. And it's transitions out of uh, Canada. They have a big U S presence as well, mostly in the Northeast. Um, but she'd be a great person for you to podcast. Is it Phelps? Um, P H Phillips. I think it's Phillips. Yeah. Okay. And, and so she's, uh, does transitions. But, yeah. but she also um, is um, practice well, management, or, or yeah, was she, she doing your, or was she doing your transition to buy that practice? She, she, no, she's a so transitions is the name of the company. It doesn't mean they do transitioning offices, office ownership. That's not their main thing. Their main thing is as a as a practice consultant, um, just like uh, Levine Group and uh, uh, Productive Dentist Academy. Same same idea. Um, just, uh, their, their, their philosophy as all the, as they all do, their philosophy is a little different. Um, she came in and did an initial evaluation probably after I'd been in the office for about, uh, four or five years. Um, we, you know, we, we took the consultation. We didn't end up using them as consultants, but I was back and forth with her a fair bit. Um, and then I went to Scott Loon's group, uh, breakaway, uh, um, again, uh, their system is set up not necessarily to act as consultants, but to have courses on practice management and sort of uh, do it yourself with, with some guidelines from them. And then who I ended up working with was Productive Dentist Academy. Um, and that's a really unfortunate name because it implies to everyone that it's all about production, but it's really about, you know, providing the best care to patients in the best manner possible for them. Um, so that's we went Bruce through Baird. That. That's Bruce Baird. Yeah. And, and you um, thought, and you thought that was the, uh, the best one? You know, uh, that's what I, that's who we utilize. Um, that's who we use and we use them for, uh, two or three years. Um, again, I started out with, um, with, uh, watching his lecture on, uh, on dental town and that lecture, um, changed my mindset and changed my production overnight. My production jumped, I bet it jumped $200 an hour overnight from watching that podcast. Well, I decreased the cost of my patients and did better care. Um, and that was a confluence of the way our insurance system works and the environment of practice that I was in, but just thinking about, you know, how to do things best for patients and make win-wins out of everything. Um, uh, it, it, it really, it, it really, uh, uh, changed the way I thought about uh, care and, and, and I'd encourage anybody to watch that lecture and, um, uh, and see if it's something that would make sense for them. Um, uh, about three years later, we ended up hiring them as, uh, as consultants after I went to their, um, uh, their, their weekend seminar in Texas, in Texas. Yeah. yeah. So I started that actually as an associate. Um, uh, I went and, you know, uh, Dr. Campbell was nice enough to sort of let me make some changes in the office. And, um, you know, it really, you know, it really helped look at what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, and, uh, 
um, the, the focus on, you know, comprehensive care that we had maybe been missing for, for years. Um, it, uh, it, it really helped develop that and, you know, helped us take on some of these bigger cases and, uh, really present them to patients and make it so that they were things that, that they wanted. You don't want to sell what you're doing. Um, but when someone comes in with, uh, you know, worn down dentition, doesn't like the way it looks, uh, and they require $50,000 worth of dentistry because of everything broken, you know, you got to have a plan for them to do it. And they just, they made it easier to do that. So, um, what about Bruce Beard did that? I mean, you, you, you just said some powerful things. I mean, it really rocked your world. Uh, succinctly, what, what, what do you think Bruce Beard uh, woke you to? Well, it was about, you know, um, part of it is you, you somewhat take money out of the equation, but to me what it was, and I didn't, you know, I sort of adapted what Bruce said. Um, his big thing is, is to, you know, see patients do all the treatment you can in one visit. Um, and then he finances them out. They've got a, a part of the, part of the arm of that company is, um, comprehensive or compassionate finance, um, that facilitates, um, uh, patient lending. It's, it's another, um, uh, avenue like, um, care credit. Um, so his big thing is to get all the work done in as little time as possible. Um, and for me, the insurance here was quite good. And, uh, you know, how it worked was if I was seeing a patient for, for one crown, if I did the next crown at a substantial discount, uh, which would have the patients pay very little when it came, when you look at what they recovered from their insurance, I could do two. And it took me an extra 10 or 15 minutes. So it, it was a no brainer. Um, it was a win win for everybody. Um, uh, so that's what I started to do. And I didn't even tell patients I was really doing it. I just, uh, our office, um, you know, has, has always had sort of a floating fee schedule. Um, we, um, we've, uh, we, you know, every dentist on earth decreases their, their fees. Um, but when something's harder, um, sometimes the fees need to increase because it takes you a lot longer. And what we did was we, uh, I just saw these patients and I said, you know what, if we do two, it's going to be, uh, you know, for, for one crown, it's going to be 1500 and for two crowns, it's going to be, you know, 22, 2,500, whatever the number was. And it, it worked really well for them. Um, so it just got me doing more things that were needed that we were going to do anyways, um, at the same appointment at the same visit and got me to structurally plan out my treatment planning better with patients. So that, that's, a, that's um, what everyone says, but they don't want to do. They, the dentist says, well, I, I don't want to sell dentistry. And it's like, guys, the diagnosis, the treatment plan, and the presentation determines yeah. if you ever get to do any dentistry. If you can't diagnose, yeah. um, you know, they start off diagnosing a tooth, and then after five years, they move up to a quadrant, and at the end of the decade, it should be full mouth. And they, yeah. they don't want to do that. They want to do one tooth dentistry and blame it on the insurance company only pays a max of a thousand. And then they, yeah. they, they don't, their model in their mind doesn't account for the fact that five billion earthlings uh, don't have dental insurance. So how, how does it affect them differently? And oh, then yeah. uh, presenting the whole case. So, so how did you, um, what changed your psyche of not wanting to quote sell dentistry? to now wanting to do a complete diagnosis exam, present the whole thing, including finance? Well, I mean, for the first step, you try to take money out of the equation. You, you, you need to show the patients what's going on. Um, you, need to, um, uh, you need to have them become aware of it. And a lot of times they're coming in asking you, asking you for it. And it's, you know, I was really lucky because a lot of the patients I inherited were from dentists that sort of hung on a little bit too long working because they had to. And the patients came in knowing it. So they, they, you asked them, you know, how, 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 how do you think things are like, ah, there's probably going to be a lot of work there. I haven't had anything done in a while. Um, or you get a new patient that comes in who hasn't been to the dentist for five, six years. So those are ones that are easier to, you don't even have to sell them. You just have to tell them what they need. Um, and then you worry about the finances later. So you can't start talking about money until you start talking about what stage they're at, how they got there, what needs to be done. And money is always going to come. It, it's important, but um, uh, the need to do the work and the amount that it costs are two different things. And you got to tackle the 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 work that's needed first, and then you can tackle the money issues. And you know, Bruce always says, like, I don't care if we do this in four hours or four years. It's up to you. 
Um, that's one of his lines that he, that, that he, um, that, 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 or one of his, one of his, um, phrases that he says to patients, you know, it, it's, it's up to your mouth. You do it at your speed, but it's, it's, uh, it's easier and better for you if we do it all at once. Um, well, well, they, they, they do it with their cars. I mean, they do their houses. I mean, one, one of the most interesting things about a poor underdeveloped country, which I've yeah. been to a gazillion of versus the, you know, the 20 really rich countries where, you know, median incomes, 50, $60,000 is you'll see them build their houses over years. Instead of getting the money and build their yeah. house, they save up and they get the land and they save up and they build a foundation. Basically the houses are never finished. They're, they're always under construction. And some of that's tax yeah. code because yeah. once you declare your house is done, then yeah. the stupid mob will come out there and see how much they can shake you down for, uh, yeah, yeah. for their, uh, uh taxation. That's, that's uh, why all the that's why all the houses in Greece have rebar sticking through their roofs. Right, right, yeah, and uh, it's all it's all uh, part of the the, the mob's sixty thousand page tax code. Uh, but um, patients want their house now and paid over thirty years. They want their car now and paid over five years. They want their smile makeover done now and paid off a couple of years. I mean, that's what they all want. And the yeah. most resistance to that obvious decision is lives in between the ears of dentists. I mean, they yeah. just, I mean, it, it's so, and, and I'm like, what, what did you see in your life that makes you think that's, that's, that's not the way it is. I mean, they want instant gratification and pay for tomorrow. Yeah. And it was hard for me coming from Canada where, you know, the system that we have there is, uh, is medicine is it's government run and it's, it's paid for through taxes. Um, and dentistry isn't so, one of the reasons why I ended up working in the States while I was living in Montreal was because I was running into a lot of, well, if it costs me anything, I'm not going to get it done. And in, in, when I was working in Montreal and, um, and, uh, near Ottawa, um, when I went to the States, I did find that in the U S people were much more receptive to, it was it, when you went to the doctor, you were, you, you had an expected copay. Um, and my experience in small town Canada, uh, was that patients were, were quite resistant to, paying for dental treatment. So I sort of brought that with me and maybe that just existed because that was in my head and not theirs. But, uh, I did find it a little bit easier working in, uh, in the U S doing, um, uh, just, it, I'm talking about single crowns. I wasn't doing full rehabs or anything down there. Um, but even doing uh, single crowns, uh, the, the American system seemed to be a lot more receptive than, than in Canada, but that could have been just my perception. We'll talk about that system because you're from Canada and uh, the country's part of England and they have socialized medicine or nationally paid for uh, medicine. Yeah. The United States uh, doesn't. Um, yeah. They got they start on two different journeys. It's very bizarre how at the end of World War II, um, healthcare was not was paid completely different after, um, before World War II is a very private enterprise. And then um, because of the World War II effort, uh, they, they passed wage controls because they thought yeah. that was a good idea to build up for the war. But when they push yeah. wage controls, the, there's the lawyer mob, you can't raise the wages. So the muscle men, the unions, the mobsters, they said, okay, well, we want something. And they, they argued for uh, medical benefits and dental benefits. And yeah. all the economists at the time was saying, why would the government or your employer get involved with your health care? They're not going to buy your house, your car, your groceries. But nevertheless, yeah. that's how it took off 70 years ago. So here yeah. we are at 2020, 70 years after the war. Um, what do you think the pros and cons is of the uh, UK and Canada paying for the health care, uh, almost nothing out of pocket, uh, versus the American system or uh, the other systems? Well, there's a few differences between Canada and the States, and I'm not as familiar with the UK, but, um, you know, in Canada, there's this perception that healthcare is all covered by the government. Um, and your basic healthcare is, um, but you know, if you want to get physio, it's not covered. The dentist isn't covered. Chiropractic isn't covered. What's physio? Um, physiotherapy. Physical uh, therapist. Okay. Physical, yeah, therapy. physical therapist. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of the rehabilitation isn't covered. You know, uh, if you look, if you take dentistry out of it, one third of the money that goes in the Canadian healthcare system comes from private, um, private funding. And it's interesting here right now, cause we're actually looking at doing a new, uh, revamping our healthcare system. And I was racking my brain trying to think of an intervention and a change in healthcare that, 
made it better for patients and better for the providers. And I couldn't think of one until finally what I thought about was when Canada introduced their national health care plan, I think it was in the 50s, it could be the 40s. But, you know, you had people showing up at the emergency room with livestock in the back trying to trade it for an emergency room visit. Uh, and the doctors weren't being compensated and patients, you know, weren't getting care. They're only going for emergencies. So the Canadian government said, yeah, we're going to nationalize this healthcare system. Um, and uh, I don't know where the money came from. It was increased taxes. I'm sure it was. Um, or it was just a surplus in taxes. I'm, however it came from, uh, I think that did improve improve healthcare. Um, the the good thing about you know Canada is is that everyone's got a base level of care, and maybe because of the size of us, we've only got fifteen or twenty medical schools. I think if you show up at a hospital in Canada, you're going to get more consistent care um, than you uh, may in a country with a lot more facilities. Um, in in the state, I, it's inarguable that the high end care is 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 better in in the states than in Canada. I shouldn't say it's inarguable. It's probably better in the U.S. than in Canada. Um, uh, but in Canada, what we find is that things are very restrictive. If you want a hip replacement, you're waiting over a year for it. Heck, if you want a CT scan, unless you're in the hospital in the emergency department, you're going to wait six months for a CT scan in a lot of provinces in Canada. So things go really slow in Canada. Um, whether that's better or worse is to be debated. In the States and in Bermuda, you need an MRI or a CT, you can get it in a couple in a week or two. Um, so, um, you know, the big difference, I think, is that, and the, the UK kind of has this hybridized version of it. Um, the big difference is, is that in Canada, we tie your basic health care to your citizenship or your status. Um, in the States and in Bermuda right now, we tie it to your job. And as long as you tie healthcare to a job and there's no there's no backfall of some form of government sponsored agency, you're going to have people that don't have healthcare. Um, and you know, my view of healthcare is is that basic healthcare is a human right. Like you need to have we need to we need to provide healthcare for everybody no matter what. But you know, not everyone can jump on a plane and fly to Johns Hopkins when they want to, which is sort of what happens here right now. Um, we've got this elite level of healthcare on the island that everybody wants, but we and we ask ourselves why our our, our expenses are so high. Well, maybe maybe that's maybe that's the reason. And you know, although basic healthcare is a right, you know, the top end healthcare, being able to you know not have lines and everything, that's a huge huge privilege. And um, uh, with those privileges comes responsibility, and also comes you know someone's got to pay for it. Well, I mean, I don't, um, you know, they, they always, okay, first of all, when you say um, healthcare is a human right, I mean, do, um, what about food? I mean, what about water? Well, what about, all, I mean, yeah, I mean, what, what, what isn't a human right if you needed it for survival? What, what about the need to reproduce and have offspring? But here, here's, well, that, here's my beef with it, because I've seen, yeah. um, you know, like say, I just left at Israel, and um, the most unique thing about their dental situation is um, it's more, there's a lot of people that live there from Russia. So yeah. their, their three major DSOs are all connected with the hospital, which is, I just love the details. But the bottom line is like, like, look at government housing. You know, if the government really wanted to help the poor with housing, they should have said, okay, all these people, we're going to give this much money each month. Here's 400 bucks. Maybe you'll yeah. want to go live with your mom. Maybe you'll want to go live with your sister. Maybe you, you'll innovate and figure it out. But, oh, no, it's, yeah. it's never that. It's about their bureaucracy and control. So they build the government housing. Then you're not an owner. And you look at the morale of the people there and they're, you know, they, it's just horrible. P government public housing is the worst. Same thing yeah. with healthcare. If they really cared about your healthcare, they'd say, hey, um, we think um, more people should need healthcare. So we're going to give you, you know, this much money every month or every year for you yeah. to go to healthcare. And you said that in Canada, mm -hmm. one third of the healthcare is private. So they yeah. might have more innovations, more service. And they might take those dollars and go there. Uh, but the yeah. government's like, well, no, we're not going to do that. What if they just take the money and go buy Cheetos? Oh, yeah. so they want to. So it, it's always they want to help you. It's kind of like they come up to you. They take a baseball bat. They break your knees. And then yeah. they, they want to help you um, buy a wheelchair. It's like if you want to help someone. Do it like your mom. When, you, when your mom needs help, you give her $500. You don't go tell her exactly what she can do with it or not do with it. And, and public housing, if they would have taken that same trillion dollars that mm -hmm. Johnson and those guys and their greater society, if they just would have given those people that money, 
They would have yeah. left those cities. They would have bought trailer homes, land, small houses, moved rural. They, they, they would have reinvented themselves, but that's never what the government wants to do. They want to control the entire yeah. situation until it's completely unaffordable. Then say, see, you guys can't do it. Now we need to take over the whole thing. I mean, um, yeah. you know, and it's always going to come down to checks and balances. Yeah. And, uh, and they're just not into checks and balances. And that's why I tell yeah. Dennis in America, do not do Medicaid. Because yeah. when your receptionist is undertrained because you don't take her to CE and she starts mis screwing up all the Medicaid billing, um, yeah. and if Medicaid finds out about it, they're going to kidnap you and put you in a cage. But yeah. if you did that with free enterprise, they're going to sue you and 99% of lawsuits never go to court because you're business people. So you settled out, but you just can't get in bed with the government because they're just, I mean, they got 3 million people in jail and you want to do business with those guys. Why don't you go do uh, business with the mob? Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, it's interesting. When I left Canada, I thought, uh, I thought that having a healthcare system that took away the right to really choose uh, what level of care you got was, was problematic. Uh, and I looked at it from my, uh, my father's point of view as a dentist, he, uh, one of his mates needed a hip replacement and he couldn't go pay to get his hip replaced in Canada. He couldn't have private insurance to do it. Um, so he had to wait just like everybody else did to go get his hip replaced. Um, which meant that, you know, if he couldn't work for three to six months, um, and when that happened, not only couldn't he not work, you know, his staff can't work. So, so that's problematic. You can't, you can't really have that sort of system. Um, but then you move to a place where there's, you know, there, there's no backfall of healthcare and you see people that are, that are struggling and don't have any sort of, sort of coverage. Um, it, um, it becomes, uh, you, you start to, 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 to look at it and think, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to each, to, to each system. Um, yeah. And that's the problem. There's no perfect system. Right. Humans are, are incredibly complicated. So now that you're the owner, um, as opposed to the associate, do you see evaluating uh, new purchases? Um, did you look at them differently? And how do you, um, like, like when you look at the, the big expense, the CAD CAM, yeah. the CBCT, uh, the, the hard tissue lasers, I mean, those are $300,000 purchases. How, how does your mind uh, work those through those decisions? So for me, uh, you know, I looked at it and you know, the first big piece of equipment that, um, that we, that, that, uh, we bought was, um, uh, an iTero scanner. And for us, that was a no brainer. I had, uh, we had our criteria laid out. We wanted it to be submittable to Invisalign because we were doing a lot of Invisalign. We wanted it to be, um, uh, video capture. Um, cause you know, the, the initial, um, the initial uh, CAD cams were, you know, point and click eight different pictures or 12 different pictures had to be stitched together. So um, we wanted it to go to Invisalign. We wanted it to be able to do restorative and we wanted it to be a video capture. So as soon as the iTero elements came out, it satisfied all those. We said, yeah, forget it. That's we're, we're, we're buying that. And that, that worked out well. Um, uh, so when you're thinking about buying something, you got to figure out what's the, what's the, is it going to make it faster, easier, and higher quality? And for Invisalign, uh, the iTero was a no-brainer. Um, when you come to the restorative side, it, it becomes a, a little bit different. Um, where I've sort of failed as an owner is, is that I've made some bigger purchases and haven't quite figured out how to integrate them into the practice, ideally. Um, uh, I do a lot of implants. So the one thing that the first big uh, ticket item that I bought when I owned the practice was, um, was uh, a cone beam machine. Um, and, uh, I, I knew that I wanted it. Uh, I knew that, that I needed it. I, I didn't have a good business plan in terms of how I was going to generate the revenue to pay for it, but I generated enough revenue that I could buy it. And I figured I would just increase my, my, um, my implants I was doing to, to, to make up the difference. Um, problem is you go from a pan to a CBCT and you get into this old insurance I equation again, insurance will pay for a pan, but they won't pay for a CBCT, which is hopefully a matter of time. Um, so I looked at that and, and, and that, that worked out, uh, worked out well, but you know, where I failed was thinking about, you know, how was I going to integrate things into the, into the office? Um, because the iTero didn't, um, doesn't do as good a job, uh, uh, uh restoratively as some of the other scanners do. Um, particularly when you, when you want to start scanning things extra orally like dentures and, um, uh, models and stuff. Uh, I need a different scanner. So I bought the Medit 3000. 
which is a good scanner, but I didn't think about the fact that I got a seven operatory office. And one of the great things with the iTero is that it's on this really nice stand. that's easy to roll around. I got no space for the minute. I got nowhere to put it. Uh, and it's, it's become logistically a, a nightmare to move the thing around in the office. Um, same with, uh, a, um, uh, a 3d printer. I've got one sitting in my apartment at home that I use from time to time, but I don't have it in the office. I don't have the space for it. So I bought it knowing I needed it or thinking that I needed it, but I didn't know how I was going to monetize it. How I was going to, um, because I was paying cash, I didn't have to think about I was paying for it. Um, and then where it was going to go. Um, and then how I was going to integrate it with, um, uh, with my staff. Um, the CBCT, I think I did a pretty good job. Uh, one of the CE courses I did, I flew Dale Miles down here to give us a lecture. Um, he came and spoke to us. Uh, he lives right up the street from me. Yeah, I know. He said, he said, uh, um, and he's done a few things on Dental Town, um, uh, which, uh, which would be good. He, I think he, I know he's got a series of, of lectures that, that uh, he'd be interested in getting out to the public. Um, uh, so he came down. And again, instead of, instead of me flying 10 people up to go see him, I flew him down here. Um, and then the rest of the uh, island benefited as well. We did a, a couple day talk with, with him. Uh, so back to purchases, you got to figure out what's available locally, how you're going to use it, um, and how you're going to pay for it. Um, and then the third thing is, is like, how are you going to integrate it into your practice, integrate it into your workflow, integrate it into your physical space, all that stuff's important. Um, and not everyone tells you about it before you buy them. Right. I, I can't believe we went over an hour, man. I'm trying to think of, um, um, what, what, what were you uh, thinking I would talk about that we didn't talk about? Um, uh, I think we got, uh, we got, we got, we got through most of it. Um, uh, you know, we, uh, we talked about consultants. We talked about the Island, um, you know, uh, you know, it, uh, integrating things into the practice, um, and just learn, well, hopefully people learn from my mistakes, um, of, uh, of, of how to, uh, of how to really, um, uh, think about things before you, before you go purchase them. And of, of those 25 to 30 dentists, how many of them own their own dental office owner operators and how many of them are employees? Uh, there are about, there's probably 15 owners and 10 to 15 employees. I would think that is interesting. Um, 15 owners and 10 to 15 employees. So that would, that, that's a nice sample. So 15 owner operators. Yeah. And how many um, employees? Uh, probably 15, 10 to 15. 10 to 15. So, and you think yeah. there's 25 to 30. That is actually a really nice sample. You have a finite <laughs> island with yeah. people coming a third UK, a third Canada, a third US. They're yeah. all the same species, sapien. Yeah. And they're in with 60,000 people. And it was yeah. roughly 50, 50. Cause this is what I've been saying forever. When, um, when dentistry started to consolidate, I said, well, let's look at the lawyers. Um, half of them work for a big firm and yeah. half of them are owner operators. It's a different cat. Some people yeah. like to work in teams and they like the org chart and there's all kinds of advantages for their unique situation in life. Maybe they're married kids, whatever. Uh, yeah. They don't like marketing business. They don't like the stress, uh, but it's about half and half for lawyers and it's half and half for Ber uh, Bermuda. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. What, what's the number in the U.S.? Um, well, um, I'm in, you know, the U S is a big place, but it's, um, you know, Arizona, 18% of the dentists are now uh, affiliated with a DSO. We're number one in Arizona because we, if you're licensed anywhere in the state, in, in any state in good standing in America for any profession, nursing, architect, dentist, you can come to Arizona and you're licensed. Uh, yeah. so we're at 18%, but there's five states that don't even have the, the, the other end of the, uh, distribution, five states don't even have 1%. So, yeah. um, but you know, talking, uh, you know, every time I talk to Rick Workman, I mean, that guy's got a thousand offices. Bob Fontana has got a thousand, um, Stephen Thorns, you know, these, these guys are all, uh, past or approaching a thousand. Um, yeah. but I, I could see, uh, one or two generations from now, half employees and half owner operators. I could totally yeah. see that. 
And what do you think of the DSOs? Do you think that that's a, a, the big DSO is a model that's going to continue, or do you think it's more of a smaller model or, or bigger group practices that's going to going to be um, going to be um, uh, the norm moving forward? Well, money is the answer. So, what's the question? I mean, Wall Street won't take any of their stock and exchange it for equity. That none of none of them could go public. Heartland. Um, yeah. um, um, Aspen, Pacific Dental. So Wall Street won't touch their money. So that's a red flag. And what? And I think it's because what I um, to go public, they're going to need to take at least you know fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17, 18 percent off the top and give it to Wall Street. Well, yeah, that, that means I sign up with a DSO and they're gonna take 18 percent off the top. Hell, my my total lab fee and supplies isn't that much money. So what yeah. I continue to see is that the first layer of management, you know, when you're in a, when you're in a town of a uh, hundred thousand and you got one office, um, when you go to one level of management. And yeah. get a north, south, east, west where I can have a full time person for accounting to know my numbers. I can have a full time HR uh, to attract and retrain the best employees, and one person doing the marketing, and I can scale the whole city. Man, that three four person operation takes a takes your four average offices, which do like seven eighty. Now they're all one point two, one point three, one point four. Uh, the yeah. dentists in those places, a lot of times they're partners, which I don't recommend. Um, because, um, you know, um, I just don't want to marry a man dentist, uh, yeah. you know, um, but, um, yeah, I, so I think one layer of management dentistry is mm -hmm. awesome. I, 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 so I think that the, the group practice of five locations or less, which is the 80% of the DSO mm -hmm. market today is a better working model. I, I just yeah. don't see how the second tier headquarters in bed with Wall Street, giving them so much uh, um, free cash flow off the top. I, I don't see how that makes sense. Yeah, and then do you see um, the turnover as being a major limiting factor of these D DSOs over the long term? And and do these smaller offices, these smaller DSOs, are they better in terms of the turnover? Well, it's um, it's clear that the turnover is multifactorial um, and and most tied to birth rate. I mean, you go to Japan. I you know I've I've been there. I did several podcasts in Japan. I mean. The, the lifestyle was so brutal that the women quit having babies. They're like, I'm not going to have a newborn kid and have it stress out through high school to get into the best college, to get the best job, then work 12 hours a day, seven days a week till they drop dead. So, so they, they rebelled. They said, I'm not having a kid and I'm, um, I'm, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm cutting back. And so yeah. I think, um, I think there's a lot of people who um, are in dental school that look at their dad and their dad or mom was a dentist and they wore several hats and they worked 10 hours a day, five, six days. It was a total lifestyle uh, that, yeah. they, that they don't want to have. And I think, um, I think it'll drift. I, I can totally see this drifting to the median uh, where half will be owner operators and wear many hats and half will be independents. Um, I mean, dentistry is a job. And yeah. um, I, I, I think that'll probably be the equilibrium. Yeah, I know you said something interesting there about watching your, your parents. I find myself uh, doing the, the same thing. Growing up with my dad as a dentist, there's a lot of great things about it. But uh, the, the one thing that bugged me as a kid was he was always involved with work. I said to myself, well, I'm not going to do that with my kids. And now I'm finding myself just repeating the same thing that my father did, you know, uh, 30 years ago with, with, uh, with my kids. You, get in, you know how it is as a dentist. You get involved uh, with your patients. You're thinking about your day. And... You know, it's hard to be present all the time. So, so, so. you should really look at the, I mean, I think this is the, uh, the coolest thing. Bermuda, um, 30, let's just say 30 offices, 15 owner, 15 employee. You should really drill that number down because it might be very profound. I mean, is there something statistically significant with the 15 owner operators that are not the 15 employee uh, dentist? Um, you know, um, I, I, I wish you... You know, you're in the Bermuda Dental Association. You're with the Bermuda Dental Board. I'd get the exact yeah. number mm -hmm. and uh, and post it or write it up or put it on Dental Town because that that's a really unique data set because, I mean, it's the same humans. They're from three different UK, Canada, the United States. And yeah. uh, I, I think that's where it's going to go. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, certainly those numbers are right there. I could, I could get, if nowhere else, I can get it from the phone book. And, and what was the last question you asked? Uh, I, I don't even, re I don't yeah, even remember. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think that's where it's going to go, but, uh, 
Uh, any other last thoughts? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. My last question was just the, the dentist turnover is what I was worried oh, about. Oh, yeah, the, the turnover. Um, I was talking about that, the um, the repelling. So the little girl in Japan, her dad worked for Honda her whole life, and he got a job there at 25. Uh, my Uncle Pat got a job at Mobile Oil when he was 16 delivering mail, and he retired there when he was 65. Those days are gone. And, yeah. it, and if you go look at the uh, Fang, Facebook, Apple, um, Amazon, Netflix, Google, they have the most money, the most stock wages, the most any kid could ever imagine to get out of school. And, and Amazon, um, all their employees turn over in a year and Facebook does the best about two years. When you look at DSOs, Heartland holds them the longest at two years. Everyone else is about a year. And the um, the reason Heartland holds them is the, the mentorship thing. Rick is a dentist in Effingham, and he knows the importance of mentorship. So when you yeah. get a job at, at Heartland, you know, you're going to, if you want to learn Invisalign or place implants, <clears throat> they're going to dump a ton of money uh, because a lot of dentists, they get um, on this program where I want to do, I want to work at Heartland for five years and get my FAGD and Visline certified and place implants or whatever. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you, you have the rise of the individual. So it used to be I'm born and I have to conform to my father, my tribe and the queen. And, and that all changed. I think it completely flipped when Steve Jobs stuck the internet and the individual cell phone, I think that was the end of the first five, that from the pyramids to that was the first 5,000 years, all government tribe down. And now this individual sitting there with a stronger computer than Neil Armstrong had on the moon. And now it's all about the rise of the individual, liberty, freedom. And I, I, think, I think the next century is going to be Sapien's finest century ever, when every damn sapien, um, four and a half billion humans are on the internet, hold by their hand with their little opposing thumb, and that's going to be the biggest game changer in the world. And everybody got their roots um, for the last 5,000 years, knowing that the people they lorded over, 90% of them were illiterate and couldn't read or write. So yeah. when this dentist comes out of school with eight years of college, that's why I think the law firm, that, that's what I would try to do. I would compare it to the, the law firm on Bermuda because mm -hmm. when you look at the United States, the, this, um, you know, four and a half percent of the world's population, that's a huge sample size. Half the lawyers work in a form, half are independent. Um, I, I think this might be a psycho sapien dental lawyer observation that about half of these people are going to want to... Um, being owner operator, it's a lifestyle. You got to be into it. Uh, you, you're either into it or you're not, like like anything. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think, uh, will you do that and post it on Dental Town? Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I, I'll, I'll look at the exact demographics of uh, owners and uh, operators, and you know, it's pretty easy. I think our biggest office has got four doctors in it, um, and uh, a good, and the other ones are all one or two. So. Yeah, um, and, and are those employee dentists or d just knowing in the back of your mind or any of them more likely uh, to be single fathers raising kids without a wife or single mothers? Uh, or? Most of them are, um, sorry, is, is that with, it? so uh, one of them's a father-daughter, a couple of them are the retired dentist stayed on, um, uh, a couple of them are younger dentists just starting out, um, so uh, a couple of them have spouses working here on um on uh on uh, work for other companies so the spouse came down and the the, uh, the partner needed a job um so so uh um and uh we don't have i'm trying to think we've only got one or two partnerships and as you've seen in the states a lot of partnerships fail so yeah uh, it's, a, it's a sexless marriage uh, yeah that's what a dental partnership is a sexless marriage how, how does that sound you know, they, they just advertise them. Hey, would you be interested in a sexless marriage? Uh, no. Why? Well, I've yeah. got something. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I just, you know, they, they, they get so much noise because there's so many people making a lot of money selling the partnerships. Uh, yeah. And then they're gone. And, uh, it's just, and how do you have individual freedom when you're locked down on a contract in a partnership? Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. And, and that's why things work well in my situation. And that's one of the reasons why I stayed as an associate so long because – Partnership, I just, there's potential problems. Uh, and then you got to, you know, you're dealing with lawyers and all the rest of it. So it just, I think in both of our minds, we it was always going to be a, a sale as opposed to a, a partnership. But I, I could name uh, 100 dentists yeah. that sold a partnership for, say, say five, $600,000. 
five years yeah. later is a disaster. They had to spend that five or 600,000 in legal fees for years in yeah. order to pay them the 500,000 back. So they got yeah. 500,000 and it took them a million dollars to get it back. I mean, humans are crazy. And yeah. uh, you know. Yeah. So, all right. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank um, you. Um, it was just an honor and I hope the rest of your day goes fantastic. Yeah, and thank you for everything you do for Dentistry, Howard. It's great uh, uh, all you do for all the young dentists out there and all of us stuck on little islands like this. Uh, right on, man. Uh, the, the biggest, the greatest island story I ever heard, I was lecturing um, in London and some guy came out to me. He was on an island I'd never even heard of. And he was the only dentist on there. And when he turned 65, retired. But every day people kept knocking on his door because no one came to buy his practice. And so here it was seven years later, he's still retired, but he has to go to his dental office every day to go see an emergency patient. And he learned everything on Dental Town on the internet. And, and he just told me the internet changed island dentistry forever. Yeah, well, it certainly it certainly made things interesting here. And if we can ever get you down here to talk, Howard, that'd be great. Whenever you want, let's do it. All right, perfect. All Thanks right, so much. have a great day.